They want us all to give up, give up hope, give up the idea that we can change anything so they can take over everything. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. There's a shift happening in the American consciousness right now, where the idea that we all bought into that if we just work hard enough, we will make it is starting to feel like a bit of a scam. This concept of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is beginning to feel like a cruel joke, especially if you're working a minimum wage job or in the gig economy or dealing with medical or student debt or trying to buy a house or afford childcare. This idea that the trials we as Americans face, the struggle so many of us have to deal with just to make ends meet, is somehow the result of our own actions or shortcomings, rather than acknowledging we're actually living in an oppressive system that's been rigged against most of us for the past 40 years, is really starting to chafe. This is, of course, not to say that people aren't personally responsible for their actions. They are. But we also need to come to terms with the fact that we used to live in a country where one person could sustain a family of four, where housing was accessible, where public education was good and higher education was affordable, if not free. There was a time in the not so distant American past that we had both a thriving middle class and a booming economy where people had pensions and benefits and social security was something you could live on rather than just one more thing for Republicans to get rid of. But it's becoming increasingly clear that starting in the 1970s and put into overdrive by the Reagan administration, America began what we could safely call a corporate takeover of American politics, where the wealth of this country became increasingly concentrated into fewer and fewer hands while everyone else struggled. And that struggle is now hitting a tipping point. We clearly can't carry on like this. People just do not make enough money to live in this country anymore. People with full-time jobs can't afford a place to live. People are starting their careers drowning in debt for school they were told they had to attend. People deep into their adult lives can't afford to have children or buy real estate, and getting sick is the number one cause for bankruptcy. It's no wonder our suicide rates are so high. People are increasingly miserable trying to live the American dream. Yet as a country, we struggle to make any real change because a fair amount of politicians and justices in charge of passing and upholding laws that could protect us from what can only be called predatory capitalism are in many cases bought and paid for by predatory capitalists. It's a snake eating its own tails with the American public in the middle getting crushed. Look no further than the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson's first order of business, which was to cut funding to the IRS so the IRS could no longer afford to go after the richest tax cheats in America. That was the very first thing he focused on. So we simply can't go on pretending the system isn't rigged for the people at the top while the rest of us are getting screwed. To talk about how things got so bad and what we can actually do about it, I'm joined by the illustrious Robert Reich, a graduate of Dartmouth, Oxford, and Yale, Robert Reich is a professor of public policy at UC Berkeley and a senior fellow at the Bloom Center for Developing Economies. He's also served in three national administrations, including as Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton. The author of 18 books, including bestsellers The System, Who Rigged It and How to Fix It, The Common Good, and Super Capitalism, Professor Reich is also the co-creator of the 2017 Netflix documentary Saving Capitalism and the award-winning 2013 film Inequality for All. He is the co-founder of Inequality Media, co-founder of the Economic Policy Institute, and the co-founding editor of The American Prospect. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, professor, economist, and true believer in the American experiment, Robert Reich. Welcome, Professor. Hello, Lee. Thank you so much for uh, having me on. Well, thank you for coming. I've wanted to have you on for so long. I love what you guys are doing at Inequality Media, just making these complicated issues, particularly economic issues, accessible to the rest of us. Because I think we can recognize that things are broken. We just aren't quite sure how they got that way or what we're supposed to do next. Well, that's what uh, that's what I and my team are really trying to do. And uh, it, you can't have an effective democracy unless people understand what's going on. And the system is very complicated. And there are a lot of people who would like to keep it that way. Yeah, I always say it's deliberately complicated. It's done with deliberation. Absolutely. Well, as I was saying in the introduction, it's clear 
that the politics of the Reagan years, along with the whole now debunked concept of trickle down economics, really launched us into this broken system we find ourselves in now, kind of solidifying in the very richest hands American politics, where those with the wealth are able to buy those with the power and pass laws to make the country work best for them. This phenomenon of looking out for American economics over the American people was actually conceptualized prior to the 1980s with what's called the Powell Memo in 1971. Would you mind giving us a little background on Lewis Powell and his ideas that really kind of laid the foundations for corporate America to take over American politics? Lewis Powell was a lawyer in Washington before he was appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, a very conservative group, uh, becoming more so uh, during the 1970s, contacted Powell and said, we would like you to write a memo for us about what business needs to do to respond to the growing power of consumer people, environmentalists, labor. I mean, all of the voices out there that were starting to demand regulations starting to demand a response to the excesses of American capitalism. And indeed, Lewis Powell wrote a memo that said, essentially, business, you've got to pay a lot of money. You've got to invest a lot of money in Washington, in trade associations, in lobbyists, in uh, actually the, the process of getting people elected. You've got to be much more activist. And if you don't, uh, goodbye your profits, goodbye capitalism. Uh, Lewis Powell's memo was much more complicated and lengthy than I just gave, but I, I gave a summary of it, which I think is quite accurate. It went out to all of the CEOs of America, to all of the business groups of America, and it had a huge impact because during the 1970s, American business began to exercise its muscles, flex its muscles. Uh, by the end of the 1970s, by the Reagan administration, American business had established itself in Washington as the loudest voice, even louder than what, what that, at that point, trade unions were pretty loud, but even louder than trade unions, much louder than environmentalists or consumerists or uh, any other group that were, was trying to be heard. So Powell argued that the American economic system was basically under attack by consumer or labor or environmental groups, which, as you point out, in reality was just that those groups weren't doing anything other than saying like, hey, there's a social contract here and corporations have a responsibility to the consumers and their workers and the environment and not just their shareholders. And that there was a bigger picture that wasn't just corporate profit um, and that needed to be acknowledged. And Powell clearly didn't agree with that bigger picture. And he thought that, as you're saying, businesses should team up for basically what you've written is called political combat. So he sent out this memo that you're talking about that went to all the biggest businesses to sort of tell them how to better navigate and get themselves back up on the top. And this is kind of where businesses got on board and where this new political and corporate synergy really got its start. And this is also the time where tens of thousands of corporate lobbyists all showed up in Washington and in state capitals around the country to make sure that they were lobbying for what was best for the corporations and not what was best for the rest of us. Would that be a fair assessment? Yes. And let me just extend that a little bit, Lee, because what happened was the creation of an entire industry in Washington of lobbyists and lawyers uh, and public relations professionals. Many of them were ex-government, high government employees. I mean, cabinet members and senators and members of Congress, they left their positions in the public sector and became lobbyists, and they could make so much money because, again, the name of the game was money. Uh, businesses were starting to put big, big money into influencing American politics. And Washington, D.C., I saw it, went from a kind of a seedy backwater town to a glittering uh, kind of uh, emerald city uh, with regard to restaurants and bistros and hotels and and office towers that were the centers of K Street and uh, where all of the C-suites and Wall Street 
uh, denizens of America were represented. So I would say probably this is the timeline where corporations might have seen themselves as starting to fight back, right? Like if anyone, especially if the government, was looking at what they were doing to make money by, say, poisoning the environment, dumping waste into lakes, uh, targeting children, advertising dangerous projects, and they started questioning their motives in doing that, they as a group would resist. So the corporations, and then in the 80s, in partnership with the Reagan administration itself, came in and kind of started gutting the organizations that would hold them accountable, kind of defunding them or filling their leadership with kind of yes men who would overlook corporate malfeasance to the tune of profit, which is then recycled back into the environment in which everyone was living and eating and breathing and working in Washington. Uh, that's right. It was a revolution, uh, Lee, and I think it can only be described that way. Uh, in the late 70s, I was at the Federal Trade Commission, and I, like many people, were kind of surprised by this great wave, this tsunami of corporate money. Uh, we were working on a bunch of rules to protect consumers at the time, and Congress essentially stopped us in our tracks, took away our appropriation, closed the agency for weeks uh, as a kind of punishment, but also as a way of demonstrating to the rest of Washington the kind of power that corporate America was exercising. Yeah, just what they were wielding. Is this around the time that the FTC stopped enforcing kind of antitrust laws? Uh, yes, uh, and that is a related story. Uh, Robert Bork who was a professor at Yale, uh, I he was one of my professors, uh, he wrote a book called The Antitrust Paradox, which said effectively antitrust laws should not be enforced, or at least the only purpose of antitrust is consumer welfare, to keep prices down. Uh, there's no good in competition for the sake of competition. Don't worry about big corporations getting bigger. Don't worry about their political power. Well, that became part of the creed as well. And that was pushed by the big corporations. And by the time Ronald Reagan came into the White House in January uh, 1981, all of these came together, all of these movements, all of this corporate money, all of these corporate uh, sort of premises such as antitrust should not be enforced. And let me just clarify, just so I'm getting it right and so the audience understands, when we talk about antitrust, that's the 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 laws around allowing massive corporations to merge and consolidate their power, making them even more powerful. Is that is that right? Yes. And also laws uh, having to do with limiting the power of big corporations that didn't merge, that just got too big. Uh, in terms of their effects on the market. Uh, and I don't want to go into the weeds, but this really started in 1890. The Sherman Antitrust Act starts in 1890, a public uh, upsurge of uh, almost a rebellion against these giant corporations, railroads and uh, and oil uh, and, and other corporations, steel corporations that were dominating American business. Uh, and then in 1914, the Federal Trade Commission Act uh, was passed, which gave the Federal Trade Commission authority uh, to police the market against these giant combinations. So the 1890s didn't have it wrong. They could see the writing on the wall that we see today when we have about four corporations running almost every major business and we see all of our media conglomerates merging together and, and we end up with about 10 companies that run everything. And then people think, well, why don't we have better pricing? Or why is everything so expensive? Or what's going on with these eggs? You're like, well, they can charge anything they want. It's corporate greed because no one is competing with them anymore. And they saw it way back in the 1890s and it kind of carried on to today. And if we don't give these government organizations teeth to come after these companies or stop these giant mergers, then it's the consumers and the environment and the workers that are really in trouble. Exactly. Uh, in fact, what's interesting is that the Gilded Age of the 1880s and 1890s really in many ways parallels what we are now experiencing in a kind of second Gilded Age. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the huge combinations then are reflected uh, and echoed by the huge combinations right now that do have the power to push up prices because they don't have to worry about competition. Uh, you know, the Federal Reserve Board uh, thinks that prices have been pushed up by wages, 
But that's not the case. Prices are being pushed up more by big monopolistic corporations that have the power to raise prices. Yeah. If there's only four chicken companies and they all get together and say, what do you think? $9 a pound? And everyone's like, let's do it. There's nowhere else to get our chicken. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So these decisions uh, to make our country more favorable to capitalism's big winners has clearly changed our politics because now corporations have more and more money to send out the smartest and the best lawyers to kind of drown out government attorney generals or the FTC to get the results they want. It's a lot like how the IRS can't afford to go after the biggest tax cheats because these rich guys can afford better lawyers, which is ultimately how the whole system starts to feel rigged. Yes. And it's it doesn't only feel rigged, Lee. It is rigged. It is rigged. Uh, And uh, it's rigged in favor of the moneyed interests. Uh, Not only in terms of laws that are passed uh, that give the wealthy and big corporations exactly what they want most of the time, uh, but also uh, the kinds of lawyers and uh, what happens in courts because the big corporations and the moneyed interests in general uh, can afford... uh, platoons of lawyers to represent them, uh, whereas the government or the public in general uh, only can afford, you know, a limited number of lawyers. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's a system that's clearly been fixed to benefit one group over the rest of us. And I think most of us can see that now because the more benefits these people get, the more tax cuts, the more loopholes to break laws or skirt regulations, the more opportunities they get to place the environment at risk or to undervalue or underpay workers the more money they have to buy politicians to keep the whole racket going. And it's all very subtle. I mean, look at uh, an area of law that most people don't know much about. It's called bankruptcy. Well, the fact of the matter is that years ago, if you were a normal homeowner and you couldn't pay your mortgage or you were a, uh, a, a person who couldn't pay your student loan or you were somebody who, who just couldn't make it uh, make all the payments you needed, uh, you could use bankruptcy to reorganize your debt. Today, because of big corporations, mostly Wall Street banks, it is impossible for students to reorganize their student debt, and it's impossible for homeowners to reorganize their mortgage debt under bankruptcy. And yet, uh, many big corporations can use bankruptcy in ways that nobody assumed should be part of the American system uh, to get out from under, for example, labor contracts. Yeah, it's a different set of rules for a different group of people. I mean, I think at this point, there's very little that corporations and the very richest want that they don't get. Um, It's how the one signature piece of legislation from the Trump years was a permanent tax cut for the ultra rich, which added trillions of dollars to our debt. And now we get people like the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, saying we can't afford to do anything because look at our deficit, look at our debt. We have to cut these programs for the poor. We have to cut Social Security or we have to cut Medicare. I mean, he wanted to tie foreign aid to an ally to underfunding the IRS, as if we don't understand that cutting funding for a program that brings in money is the opposite of what he said was going for. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand that. I know. And that's uh, <laughs> and that's exactly why it's very important for the public to uh, kind of look under the hood uh, and see what's really going on. Uh, let me also hasten to add that uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party really are different in this regard. And I say this not just because I've been a Democrat for the last, uh, you know, 300 years, uh, but also because uh, the Democrats really are, by and large, not every one of them, but by and large, they are trying to make democracy work. Uh, The Republican Party not only has sold out to the corporate and muddied interests, but the Republican Party is basically selling out democracy. Uh, The other point I wanted to make very quickly is that it's important not to be cynical or at least so cynical about what's going on that you give up Mm -hmm. because that's what the moneyed interests want. They want us all to give up, give up hope, give up the idea that we can change anything so they can take over everything. Which is why it's kind of exciting that people are sort of starting to fight back. Like we're finally realizing what's up and we're not okay with it. Look at all the labor union strikes that have happened in this past year with workers really standing up for what they deserve, which at the very least is not to be treated simply like a cog in someone else's machine. Exactly. It's a big deal. I mean, labor, organized labor, oh, for years was sort of uh, thought of as a backwater 
Uh, in the 1950s, about a third of all private sector workers were unionized. That was a big, big number. Uh, it was it was it was big enough so that workers could actually get higher wages, not only for themselves, unionized workers, but but across the board. And now today, it's not a third. Today, only six percent of private sector workers are unionized. Well, it's very hard to have much power, notwithstanding that you've seen, uh, you know, the UAW and uh, Hollywood actors and writers and UPS uh, cave in to the Teamsters. You've got a lot of unions that are doing great work and many young people are getting very, very involved. Look at Starbucks, for example. Uh, I, I think the real union leadership today tends to be a different generation. I think people are unionizing faster than they have in decades because they're seeing the big wins. And they're also saying, like, look, if we're up against these giant corporations, what else are we supposed to do? There's a really great uh, meme that is a man standing on a pile of money who's obviously a CEO. And then there is a person standing on a pile of people meeting him at his level. So they says, OK, now let's negotiate. And I always feel like that's a great image because it's like you need the union, you need the people power behind you to actually negotiate at a level in which you are equals. Otherwise, you're completely out of luck. And that gets us back to the Powell memo and what what Powell did. Uh, because you see, without countervailing people power, uh, it's just money power. And with only money power, you have uh, capitalism that is out of control. Um, democracy is compatible with capitalism, I believe, but only if democracy is in the driver's seat. And honestly, I think people should know that Powell, who we're speaking about, he ended up as a sitting Supreme Court justice <laughs> and he ended up using his power on the court to further chip away at regulations that limited corporate power in politics. It was Powell's legal opinions in the 70s and 80s that ultimately laid the foundation for Citizens United or the right of corporations to claim that it's free speech to contribute as much money as they want to political campaigns. And then that led to the rise of super PACs and the availability and uh of the very richest to buy politicians who basically do their bidding, which ultimately makes our country even more corporate friendly and makes that tiny, tiny group at the top uh, even more money, which gives them even more buying power. So it's a vicious circle. And similar to Powell's time, I would say now we have another captured and activist Supreme Court in the bag for the very richest and the corporations, so much so that Justices like Thomas and Alito have been taking gifts and trips from the very people they're supposed to be ruling on for years. And then we have this huge case coming up, more of the U.S., that seems to have been filed with the express purpose of permanently outlawing any sort of wealth tax on billionaires in the future. What are your thoughts on more v. U.S.? Because I don't think most people know about it. And it's such a striking case. It's part of the strategy uh, that is being used by the moneyed interests. Uh, and again, I, I think the important point, Lee, is to see that the litigation strategy in the courts, the law strategy, uh, is parallel and part and parcel of the strategy in Congress and in state uh, legislatures. It's all about the moneyed interests, and you referred to a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle of the moneyed interests getting more and more power, which gives them more and more money, which gives them more and more power. Uh, and unless the people get together and have a countervailing power, uh, we are just going to see more and more of this. The Supreme Court today, I would say, is even more reactionary than the Supreme Court of uh, Powell's time. Uh, you know, we have now six Supreme Court justices uh, who are not only nominated and confirmed by Republicans, but three of the six were put in by a Republican president who lost the popular vote and was impeached twice and is now running for re-election. We won't necessarily use his name, but he has four criminal indictments against him. Now, those three of the six conservatives on the Supreme Court are doing whatever they can to pull this nation uh, kicking and screaming back into the, what, the 1940s, the 1930s, pre-Franklin D. Roosevelt, actually. 
Yeah. Pre-workers rights, pre-women's rights, pre-labor rights. Sometimes I feel like they're trying to create a whole new feudal system with a new uh, aristocracy when the rest of us just work on the land or the corporations for them. And we take what we get and we shouldn't be upset. Uh, Well, look at CEO pay. I mean, uh, this is a good example of what's been going on. And it is a function of changes in the law. Uh, In the 19... 60s, 1970s, uh, the typical CEO of a big company was earning 20 times the typical worker. Uh, By the 1990s, when I was Secretary of Labor, uh, the typical CEO was earning 60 times what the typical worker was earning. Today, the typical CEO of a big company is earning 350 times what a typical worker is earning. Uh, Now, why is that? Is the CEO today that much more valuable, uh, it more that much more productive, uh, that much uh, smarter? Uh, of course not. Uh, the the result of, I mean, the reason you have these extraordinary CEO pay packages is because the law has changed to allow those packages, and you have a lot of corporate profits going into buybacks, stock buybacks that make those packages even more lucrative. And it doesn't help that uh, these really extraordinarily wealthy people have been buying their friendships with the people who are making the laws and the people who are ruling on the laws. You know, these friendships with, say, someone like uh, Thomas or Alito are getting to live a good life on the backs of billionaires who will then rule on how well billionaires do in our society. And, And it's it's cases like more of the U.S. that concern me because one of the few tools we have left in our toolbox, which is taxes, to try and do something about this kind of ever-growing inequality in our country might be ruled on in a way that we are our hands are tied. Because clearly great wealth shouldn't be a tax shield. And yet, if you look around the country, it certainly seems like it is. Uh, well, that's very, very important uh, to underscore. Uh, when we have huge amounts of money concentrated at the top of America, uh, then democracy is threatened. Yeah. Uh, in the 1920s, a Supreme Court justice named Louis Brandeis said something that would be equally applicable today. He said, America has a choice. We can either have great wealth in the hands of a few, or we can have a democracy, but we can't have both. So, Lee, a wealth tax is the natural, inevitable next point. If we're going to have huge concentrations of wealth and we don't want those concentrations to undermine democracy, we've got to have a wealth tax that, that, that takes away some of that wealth and puts it to public purposes. Yeah. I've always said I, we could start with an inheritance tax. You know, you can give your kids, say, $50 million, but everything after that's going to be taxed it. 90%. And people will be like, oh, I don't want that. You're like, great, then build a hospital, build a bunch of schools, like help some people do something with your money. Your kids aren't going to be poor, but they can't also keep accruing generational wealth where they do very little. I think that the rich would do very well. You make your money, you live off your money, but it can't continue and continue and continue because half these kids of the super uber rich, they don't know what to do with themselves anyway. They've got no ambition because why would you? <laughs> it's Absolutely. Prob- well, it's problematic. I mean, 60%. Of the wealth of America, 60% is in the hands of heirs, children that of the part. people who actually earned it. Yep. Uh, no, so you, you can't even justify that. I mean, you can't say, well, those children and their children and their children uh, who are the non-working rich deserve that money. How do they deserve it? Yeah, it's a new aristocracy. You were born into it. Ta-da! And that aristocracy, again, it it undermines and threatens not just democracy, but the economy too. Because how do you keep an economy going if more and more of the economy's wealth and income are at the top? You know, an economy only functions if people buy stuff. And how can people buy things if they no longer have money in their pockets? So what do we do? How do we help limit the power of corporate money and this extreme wealth in our politics and our lives? Where's the Powell memo on behalf of the people of America? Well, this goes back to uh, countervailing power. Uh, It goes back to unions and small businesses and young people who are getting involved in politics. It goes back to taking the reins of power back from the moneyed interests. Yeah. 
And you think that there's a way to do that, right? You think that there's a new road that we could be taking, a reset we could be making to lay the pieces down so we can see a new path. Do you believe that? If you're like me, morning coffee is non-negotiable. But buying one every day is ludicrously expensive, and the whole process of making it at home can get boring or time-consuming. Not to mention those terrible cups of coffee you can get on the road or in hotels or business centers. Which is why I'm pleased to talk to you today about AeroPress. AeroPress is like a French press that uses a patented three-in-one brew technology that combines the best of several brew methods into one portable device for a smooth, rich, full-bodied coffee without the bitterness and grit found in other presses. AeroPress brews and cleans in less than two minutes. You just add medium fine coffee grounds, pour in hot water, stir for five seconds, brew for 30 seconds, and then press into your favorite mug and drink. As an added bonus, AeroPress can brew thousands of recipes, which probably explains why it is the barista's favorite home brewing tool and the best reviewed coffee press on the planet with more than 55,000 five-star reviews. That kind of positive feedback makes it the perfect gift or stocking stuffer for any coffee lover in your life this holiday season. AeroPress is also shockingly affordable, less than $50. And right now we've got an incredible offer for our audience when they visit aeropress.com slash politicsgirl. That's A-E-R-O-P-R-E-S-S dot com slash politics girl to save up to 20%. That's aeropress.com slash politics girl to save 20%. Ditch the drive through toss the French press, and say yes to better mornings fueled by better coffee. AeroPress ships to the U.S. and over 60 countries around the world. We thank AeroPress for sponsoring our show. Winter is not coming, it's here. And for so many people, that means struggling to find the right temperature when you sleep. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you're one of those people who wakes up too hot or too cold, then I recommend you check out Miracle Made Bed Sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics to make temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. The silver infused sheets are not only thermoregulating, but prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. Plus, Miracle sheets are just super nice, really high quality without that really high price. But see for yourself. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% and when you use our promo code politicsgirl at checkout, you'll also get three free towels and save an extra 20%. That's a heck of a deal. And Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that is trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to treat yourself a friend or a loved one this holiday season. My pals at Real Paper pose a good question. Why are we giving coal to people on the naughty list? Coal is a terrible gift. It's awful for the environment. Instead, let's consider giving gifts that everyone can use to make our planet happy. Premium sustainable bamboo toilet paper from Real Paper. Bamboo is the perfect material for toilet paper. It's amazingly soft and strong, and because it regenerates like grass, we're not killing trees just to make something that we use once and flush down the drain. Real Paper is shipped free to your door in plastic-free packaging, and you can schedule a subscription so it comes exactly when you need it without having to worry about buying it or lugging it home from the store. Plus, Real is partnered with One Tree Planted, so with every box of Real you buy, they will fund reforestation efforts around the country. So unlike other toilet paper that actively cuts down trees, Real is actively helping to replant them. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I am a toilet paper snob, and switching to Real didn't feel like I was sacrificing something to help the earth. I love the individual little paper wrapped rolls. They look cute on the back of my toilet. The quality is excellent, there's no downgrade, and in fact, when you know you're doing something good for the environment, the entire thing feels like a real upgrade. Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable, plastic-free packaging. If you head to realpaper.com slash politicsgirl and sign up for a subscription using my code politicsgirl at checkout, you will automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R 
dot com slash politics girl or enter the code politics girl to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. Let's make a change for good this year and switch to real paper. Real. It's paper for the planet. I was recently talking to a friend who said that he paid $7 a month for a certain subscription service. And I said, you might want to check that out. I'm pretty sure that's not right. When he went to look, he realized he was actually playing closer to $17 a month and he didn't even know which is why Rocket Money can be so helpful. With Rocket Money, you can quickly identify all of those sneaky subscriptions that charge you month after month or increase in subscription price without you noticing. And you can go ahead and cancel the ones you no longer use or at least be aware of where your money is going. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills all in one place. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel the subscriptions you don't want with just a press of a button. No more long wait times or annoying emails with customer service. Rocket Money does all the work for you. 80% of people have subscriptions that they have forgotten about. It's just too easy to subscribe to something and then completely forget you did it once you stop using it. When those monthly charges start rolling in, you realize you're paying for things you didn't even know you were paying for. How much do you think you're paying a month for subscriptions? Most people think they're paying $80 when they're actually paying closer to $200. This is where Rocket Money is so amazing. Join the over 5 million users and counting who are letting Rocket Money save them on average $720 a year. In fact, Rocket Money has a billion dollars in total savings so far. So stop wasting money on the things you don't use and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash politics girl. That's R-O-C-K-E-T M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash politics girl. Rocketmoney dot com slash politics girl. Well, we've officially made it to December, which means it's time for 12 days of deals at Honey Love, the go-to place for bras and shapewear. From December 1st to December 12th, Honey Love will be dropping new limited time deals nearly every day. So check it out and don't miss out. Anyone who wears these products knows there's nothing more irritating than dealing with an uncomfortable bra or shapewear, which is why Honey Love has revolutionized the bra and shapewear game. Honey Love bras feature supportive bonding that eliminates the need for underwire without sacrificing any lift. Plus they make everything with fabric that's so soft you might not want to take it off. And as for their shapewear, their targeted compression technology means you can wear it without feeling like you're suffocating. You'll immediately feel and see the difference. If you're someone in my audience that wears bras or someone in my audience who would buy a bra or shapewear for someone else, then this is a really thoughtful gift. Bras shouldn't cause bulging in the back. They shouldn't dig into your shoulders. They should make you feel better, not worse wearing one. Just like shapewear should make you feel better about yourself. Not like all your curves were taken away to be someone else's version of what you should look like. Honey Love Signature X targets and sculpts your midsection without squeezing out all your natural curves. Plus it won't ever roll down thanks to the flexible boning hidden in the sides. These are products that make you look and feel good. So treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save up to 20% off site-wide this month at honeylove.com slash politics girl. And after their purchase, when they ask you about where you heard about them, please support the show and tell them that we sent you. It's time to ditch the underwire for good and find shapewear that actually loves your shape by going to honeylove.com slash politics girl. That's honeylove.com slash politics girl. And you think that there's a way to do that, right? You think that there's a new road that we could be taking, a reset we could be making. Do you believe that? I think we have to, Lee. And, and I hope uh, when we get to the point of the next election and the election beyond that, uh, that we have leaders who essentially say to America, here's the truth. Uh, unless we take back our country economically and politically, uh, we, we're not going to have much of a country left. Uh, that we can't go on as we are going now with more and more of the wealth and power of this country concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. Yeah. And that's why it's important who we elect as well. You know, I understand that President Biden was actually a pleasant surprise to you. He's always been seen as a centrist and his plans and policies have been far more progressive than a lot of people, especially people that follow the economy, ever thought they'd be. So voting for someone like him that gives us an opening to make real change is. Yeah, absolutely. Lee. I was surprised. I mean, I was in Bill Clinton's cabinet. Yeah, uh, I 
was considered to be the leftmost person in the cabinet. Uh, and then I advised uh, Barack Obama. I thought Clinton and Obama were, were good, but they were kind of centrists. I never expected that Joe Biden would be to the left uh, of Clinton and Obama, but he is, uh, not only in terms of labor unions, walking the picket lines and supporting the most activist pro-union National Labor Relations Board we've had, uh, but also attacking monopolies, going after some of the biggest monopolies in America, Google and, uh, I mean, Amazon and, and, and others. Uh, and at the same time, uh, passing a, a huge infrastructure bill, a huge environmental bill that promotes wind and solar energy, uh, and at the same time, creating a lot of manufacturing jobs. I mean, this is with almost no congressional support, because remember, Republicans had half the Senate, and they barely, now they control the House. Uh, but even when Biden was passing all this legislation, it was by a very, very thin margin. So he deserves a huge amount of credit. Yeah, I think he does, too. I think he doesn't get anywhere near the credit he needs. But we also, you know, clearly need some form of campaign finance reform. I mean, most people are very tired of corporate money in politics. They see that it doesn't serve us. And I think we should vote with that in mind, that we will put politicians into power that will levy the power of corporations and big money in politics. Because I think getting dark money out of politics, repealing Citizens United, putting in ethics rules, maybe even term limits for Supreme Court justices, are things that people would like to see that would actually start making real change in the country again and get us to a place where it was felt more fair again. I could not agree with you more. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, every time I speak or I hear others speak uh, politically in front of crowds that are Republican or independent or Democrat, and you say, let's get big money out of politics. There is a roar of approval. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's, it's a, you know, people really don't want big money into politics. They, they want uh, Citizens United, that Supreme Court case that first opened the gates to big money. They want that reversed. Uh, they want some controls on the amount of influence big money can have. Uh, and that goes back to taxes as well. Most people would support a wealth tax on big money. Uh, many people don't even realize that in the 1950s, the highest income tax rate was 92% on great incomes, great wealth. 92%. I mean, you couldn't possibly get that passed today uh, because, well, again, the conventional wisdom is that high taxes inhibit economic growth. Not the case. No, that's when America was quote unquote great. Uh, well, you know, uh, it was in many respects. I mean, I, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it because women and a lot of black oh, people and a yeah, lot of Latino not people. Not socially great, economically great. No, but, but, but even socially, we were at least recognizing, we began to recognize in the 1960s, and I lived through this, uh, the shortcomings of this country and the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, uh, efforts to create more opportunities for women, uh, all of that was part of the public agenda. Uh, it's no longer, sadly, part of the public agenda as it was. Yeah. And you think that the ongoing dysfunction in the House, the Republican House that's being run right now, all the chaos we're seeing, uh, you know, prior to Mike Johnson being elected speaker and now that Mike Johnson has been elected speaker, you don't think this is just some random, they can't organize themselves thing. You think it's part of a manufactured plot, right? To, as you said earlier, to increase cynicism, right? The cynicism we feel for the government in general, to get us to check out, to get us to go, ugh, it's all too much, I can't deal with it. It's like a conscious tactic that they're using to exhaust lost all of us in hopes that we won't be paying attention and we won't keep doing this and we won't ask for more. You think that's true? I do. Uh, sadly, tragically, I do. I think uh, Republicans, particularly in Washington, they would like the government to be so dysfunctional <laughs> that people throw up their hands and say, well, democracy doesn't work. Maybe we need a strong man. Maybe we need an authoritarian. Oh, who is around the corner? Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, well, you see how this plays into that Trump Republican strategy. 
And that's also, I mean, when you come back to when you hear about Russia every time, it's like Russia likes nothing more than to show America doesn't work. If you say like, look, democracy doesn't work. Everyone's corrupt. Even their leaders are corrupt. Their democracy doesn't work. No one actually votes. It's all rigged. Don't bother trying to have that kind of a country that's not even existing in America anymore. I think it serves all the same purpose. I, I think that you're right. Uh, and the danger is that people, as we talked about before, become so cynical in the United States, young people particularly, yeah. uh, that they don't bother to vote. They they say, the, you know, the system is just inherently corrupt. Uh, capitalism doesn't work. And uh, therefore, we were not going to participate in the in democracy. Well, uh, that is, I want to emphasize, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people fall for that, then we don't have any hope at all. Yeah. I always say not paying attention to politics doesn't mean politics doesn't affect you. It means you can't affect it. And that's the game. We've not paid attention for so long that it allowed the wrong people to take over. And the last thing we have to do now is to check out again. Exactly. Uh, you know, they, there are a lot of mythologies surrounding the economy. Uh, one of the most distressing to me is that we have something called the free market uh, that you must not interfere with, that you create all kinds of inefficiencies if you interfere with the free market uh, without people acknowledging or understanding that the market is a human creation. It's created and enforced and maintained by government. And when you have so much power and wealth at the top, that's what that power and wealth does. It changes the rules of the market to help power and wealth. Yeah. It's like when the government bailed out the auto companies or the government bailed out the big banks or the government sent PPP loans to specific corporations. I always think about the pandemic when Saab died in Europe because it just couldn't make it. That doesn't happen here because we do have welfare. We just happen to have welfare for giant corporations and we'll hold them up even if the free market has decided they can't make it. Socialism for the rich. Absolutely. Uh, harsh capitalism, the harshest form of capitalism of all advanced countries uh, for everybody else. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this uh, horrifyingly high stakes election we have coming up? I mean, despite everything that's going on, it really does look like Donald Trump is going to be the nominee for the Republican Party. And despite the fact that it makes no sense when you look at him and President Biden on paper from everything from their accomplishments to their felony charges, it looks like the race between the two of them is going to be way too close for comfort with the fate of our country literally coming down to a handful of voters in a handful of states. So what can you leave us with or tell people with as we move into this next election year? Well, the number one and most important thing is to be politically active. Uh, if you want to hold on to our democracy, if you don't want authoritarianism or neo-fascism, you have got to be out there knocking on doors, uh, organizing, mobilizing, energizing people uh, for democracy. Uh, now, it sounds a little hokey, but that's really what it boils down to. Uh, secondly, you need to pay attention. Uh, people kind of, uh, you know, they, they fall for stereotypes. Donald Trump looks like he's tough and strong because he, you know, he huffs and he puffs and he blows the houses down. Uh, but Joe Biden, in his own way, if you listen to what he says, look at what he does uh, in, a, in a much quieter way, he is far more effective. When the press compares Biden and says, oh, he's too old, and says about Trump, well, he's, his problem is all of the criminal indictments. What the press is doing is creating a false equivalence. Why not look at Trump's age? He's only three years younger than Biden and acknowledge that he's unhinged. A lot of what comes out of his mouth uh, is something that you might be worried about in terms of particularly somebody who's very old and not quite with it. Uh, I think there ought to be more coverage of Donald Trump's, uh, well, uh, his age in terms of how it affects his his brain. Yeah. We just had a, an episode about AI and uh, how it might take over the nuclear programs or war machine. And you have to make sure that the people in charge of these giant programs with this giant money, especially in a country like America with such a huge war machine, you put someone sane in charge, you know, you put someone 
competent in charge. Joe Biden might be a senior when Donald Trump was a freshman in high school, but he's much more staid, much more wise, much more competent, and he's a much more caring person by general nature who thinks of other people and not just how it best served himself. I mean, I think you and I have been on the same page for a really long time that we're incredibly clear that if the Democrats lose in 2024, we're not just losing the presidency. We are losing American democracy, that we cannot pretend that someone like Donald Trump is not a fascist type dictator who just wants to consolidate the entire power of the American government around himself and turn us into some kind of Christian nationalist Hungarian style autocracy. And the Republican Party, specifically state representatives and the Republican House, seem sort of all in on helping him do that. And we need to get really conscious if this is the route we want to take, because I think most people, if you really laid it out for them, they would not want to do that. I agree. Uh, The fact that you have a presidential candidate who was involved in an insurrection Uh, In fact, one court in Colorado just uh, a week and a half ago said that he was, in fact, an insurrectionist. You have a president who basically said he was not going to be bound by the results of the 2020 election. Uh, And he and he said, uh, not only am I not bound by them, but uh, I don't even I don't even have any facts to justify what I'm about to say. But he said, I was the election was stolen from me. What kind of a, why should that person be running again? You know, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, says if you were involved in an insurrection, and if you once swore an oath to protect the Constitution, then you should not be allowed to run for public office once again. Yeah. Because you can't be trusted. Hello? Hello? That's one third of Congress, too, by the way. (laughs) Yes. I mean, they should all hit the road, according to the 14th Amendment. All of the election deniers out there. Yeah, absolutely. How can they be reelected when they deny something that has no basis in fact? Even Trump's attorney general said that he lost the election. His own people are flipping on him now, saying that they've always known. You know, his own chief of staff, his own team of lawyers. They're the ones saying, we knew all along. We just... We lied because it served us. Well, shame on all of them. Shame on all of them. I mean, even with all this going on, you don't feel despondent, do you? Oh, heavens no. Uh, You know, I was thinking just uh, this morning, uh, a friend of mine brought it up, uh, about 1968. Now, Lee, this may have been before your time a little bit. It was. I'm a 75 baby. But in 1968, uh, I was a senior in college. Uh, The Vietnam War was escalating. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was sending tens of thousands of Americans into Vietnam to be slaughtered and to slaughter Vietnamese. Uh, It was a complete and utter catastrophe. Uh, And I was active in the anti-war movement. uh, And then in the midst of all of this, Eugene McCarthy decided to run. Great. Um, And then Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, and Bobby Kennedy decided to run, and that's great, and then he was assassinated. Uh, and uh, and then the Democrats lost the presidency to none other than Richard Nixon. I mean, think of 1968 as the bottom. We are still not as bad off as we were in 1968. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I thought you put it really well when you reminded us that It can be difficult to find hope in cynical times, but we have to remember that the small actions and the small victories that we have, they always lead to bigger ones. And when we have a bunch of small actions and small victories, that's when the improbable becomes possible, that we can't give up. We have to keep fighting. You know, so whether it's the election or the economy, you posted on Instagram, if we allow ourselves to fall into fatalism and wallow in disappointment or become to resign to what is rather than what should be, that's when we lose the game. That the greatest enemy of positive social change is cynicism about what can be changed. And what you're saying is look at 1968. Look at how much we changed since then and look at what we could still do in the future. And I think you've said it beautifully that we have a moral duty to do everything we can, non-violently of course, to ensure that our democracy survives. And you're still positive and I agree with you that if we work together, we really can set ourselves on a far greater path. Absolutely, Lee. Uh, And you look at the young people today and how activist many of them are. 
uh, in unions and in politics, uh, AOC, uh, so many other uh, very, very impressive young politicians. Uh, you look at the degree to which women uh, are taking leadership roles. 60% of university students today are women. Uh, and that means we are changing our leadership in this country in terms of what leadership looks like. Uh, black people and Latino people are gaining ground in all kinds of leadership roles. I, I had lunch a couple of days ago with uh, a, a wonderful politician from Tennessee who was kicked out uh, basically of the Tennessee legislature and he is not going to allow that to continue. He is leading a charge, a kind of a mission uh, to improve what's what's happening in our democracy in state legislatures. And so, uh, you know, there's there's much to be positive about. Yeah, there certainly is. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today, Robert. Uh, thank you for your time, for your intellect, for your optimism. We can all use an infusion of that right now. Um, before you go, tell people how they can follow your work. I know you just started an amazing 10-part series on your terrific Substack, which everyone should, by the way, go and read, about the contradictions between the common good and American capitalism. I'm going to be following that. What else and how else can we follow you? Uh, well, uh, Inequality Media, uh, which is a group that uh, I co-founded, is a fabulous team of talented people uh, putting out uh, videos uh, every week uh, that are reaching uh, very, very large numbers. I mean, millions and millions of people and affecting how people understand the world, changing people's attitudes, because once they get the information and once they get it in ways that they can actually assimilate, uh, it's amazing that people's values are as progressive as they really are. So inequality, media, civic action, I would say support it. Look for our videos uh, on YouTube, uh, a very important source of information. Absolutely. Because once the wool is off your eyes, it just does not go back on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lee. So that was Professor Robert Reich reminding us that we can have the wealth in the hands of the select few, or we can have democracy, but we can't have both that we're at a moment in time where we must reimagine the way we do things and take the reins back from the lobbyists and the corporations and the ultra wealthy to find a way to make America work for us all. Being cynical won't help. Shutting down won't help. In fact, the idea that we'll check out because it all feels too hard is part of the strategy and we can't fall into it. I want to thank Bob for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go check out Inequality Media and see what else you can learn. The world can be a better place. It just starts with our knowing it. Until next week, PGF. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.